is illness and uh, I know so several people there now, several doctors there. So it's a kind of comfort zone. Mm, absolutely. Oh, away from home. Who is this now? Mm. If, oh, 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 okay. Okay, I just received a message. Very good. I hope by next next year everything should be clear. Hmm? Peter, if you're free, why don't you introduce Nilufar? You will do it so much the better, much better than me. Of course, I will say a few words. Yes, she did. Does she want me to introduce her? I'm asking you. She says no. Uh, did you say no, she, no, Nilufa? I can't believe that, really. <laughs> Women's Day, no? Yes. Women's Day. Women's Day. So a woman introduces a woman, right? Now you understand my other. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Actually, this would have been better, but because uh, somewhere a man also has to, you know, give. Thank you for calling me a man. I sometimes forget. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to laugh about this. Ah. Your other course is ready, yeah? Which one? Uh, world literature. I mean, contemporary world poetry. Ah, okay. Very good. The schema is completely ready. It's finding it difficult to join today because it's a working day. For whom? Today, to join this lecture, people are coming in, we're trickling like, you know, the very yes. uh, There are 16 just now. And it's already, well, it's just 5.30. Just 5.30. 5.28. Yeah. Yeah. Vidhi is saying we are live on Facebook. Oh, okay. So stop sharing the screen and stop this advertisement. Yeah. 529. I think I will start introducing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. We can start on time. Yeah, so that we start on time. Because the, the way you explain things that time is definitely not sufficient. Though, of course, this is going to be a continuation yeah, from tomorrow. Yes. Some, uh, 15 people have registered for tomorrow's program, but let's see. Okay. After hearing your lecture, maybe some more people will feel enthused. Hmm? Yes. Welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Mukta Karnik, welcoming you as a managing trustee of Institute and Trust. Exactly one year ago, on 8th of March, we, we started our institution programs. After a hiatus of two years or something, I was able to do something and start something. And then again, we had to stop because of COVID, but we did not stop. From 20th April onwards, we started our online courses. And that's how many of you know us, many of you know Professor Dr. Nilufar Parucha, because of these online programs. Some of you must have heard her name. She's, she was and she is very famous. She's a very well-known teacher, professor. She retired from the university 
as a senior professor and chair for uh, in the department of english and well as my good friend late professor dr chitre used to say academics never retire academicians never retire they just fade away but she has not even faded away she is very much active she is she is so full of you know passion for teaching and imparting knowledge about what she loves most literature she has been uh, she is a director of the diasporic constructions of home and belonging indian diaspora center she is a visiting professor of humanities at the center for excellence in basic sciences she has been a visiting faculty for many universities she is a faculty associate emeritus at the south asian studies institute university of the fraser valley bc, BC uh, british columbia canada and global fa faculty at the farley fairley dickinson university she has served on the jury of the commonwealth literature award and the sahitya academy delhi literature award in english she has also been on the jury of the rhodes scholarship has over 60 papers now i think there must be some more editions 60 is a is an old uh, figure right nilupa she has published 60 papers in national and international journals and anthologies she has authored and edited six books in the areas of post colonial indian writing diasporic indian literature and cinema and the writing of the parsis we have had made so many of our courses uh, in literature but she also participated in our course on zoroastrians and the parsis in india her uh, recent book is uh, one of her recent books is entitled indian diasporic literature and cinema and she is also co-editor of the cohabs idc's diaspora studies series she has contributed three modules on indian diasporic literature and cinema to the university grants commission's online postgraduate e pathshala and she has published short stories she has done any translations from the urdu and gujarati into english she is a great phd guide i can tell you i would also like to mention here it came up today on nilupur on the facebook it was some years uh, memory from some years ago to three years ago she said to me that man's best friend is supposed to be a dog but woman's best friend is a woman another woman so i am really very happy and very proud to have friend like professor dr nilupur barucha she is far too great than me or i i shouldn't say that uh, she is my friend she is also my guide but she is also my friend and great to have another woman who's friend to me and a real philosopher and guide also so here i present professor dr nilupur barucha to you on this very special women's day and she is going to continue with this series from tomorrow you would love to listen to her talking about women's literature indian writers as well thank you very much professor barucha the day is yours thank you thank you mukta for this very warm and uh, embarrassing uh, introduction i'm sure i don't deserve even quarter of what mukta has said to you i have not expressed what it would i feel for you uh, anyway thank you very much and a very happy women's day to everyone who has joined us to all the women to all the men in the world because women's day is to be celebrated by humanity not just by women so welcome to this uh, inaugural uh, lecture on uh, celebrating indian women's writing which will actually start from tomorrow but today is the inaugural introductory uh, session which i am going to conduct and uh, it will be uh, more detailed and uh, it would include uh, older uh, women's writing as well but from tomorrow onwards we'll be focusing on contemporary uh, indian women writers in english all right and of course in english translation 
So let me begin by sharing the PPT with you. All right, and uh, before I begin, I'm going to shut the door to my study so that uh, uh, my best friend, my husband, and my second best friend, my cat, do not intrude. All right, so here I am again, celebrating women, an introduction to Indian women's writing. Now, today, of course, is the International Women's Day. We have been receiving uh, messages galore in our social media inboxes, which are overflowing with happy Women's Day messages, which we are sending back and forth and forwarding. And it is, it is a global celebration. And it celebrates the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. So it is, it is a very comprehensive celebration of women. It's not just forwards that we are talking about, but it is a comprehensive celebration of the achievements of women. And it also calls this day, reminds us that we have to, I mean, it is eternal vigilance as far as women's equality is concerned, we do not, we cannot forget for a moment that we have to keep fighting, we have to keep agitating, we have to be active in the context of women's equality. It is not something that you achieve, you win over decades or for a centuries of uh, activism and then you say, ah, now we are here and we are in the post-feminist period and we can rest on our laurels. No, uh, as uh, somebody had said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. So as far as we are concerned, eternal vigilance is also the price of women's equality. Now, as far as this particular International Women's Day is concerned, it goes back over a century. And it starts in the context of socialism. So it goes back to the first International Women's Day celebration, which took place in 1911. So uh, it's, it's, we do not remember that decade just for what happened towards the end of it, i.e. the flu pandemic through which we are going, uh, which we are going through once again, a different kind of flu though. But also at the beginning of that decade, you had the first International Women's Day in the context of socialism. Of course, it was a very eventful decade. It was also a very tragic decade. Uh, you had the first world war happening in that decade. You had, uh, and uh, you had the Russian revolution, of course, for uh, celebration as far as the end of dynastic uh, feudal rule was concerned, although the, uh, what happened after the uh, Russian Revolution might not have been as, uh, uh, I mean, what would you say, salubrious as one might have hoped for because Stalin soon, soon took over in the 1920s. But yes, it was a very eventful decade. And right at the beginning of that decade, we have the first International Women's Day. This year, 2021, now, since then, the United Nations organization, the UNO, as you know, has taken over the celebration of the International Women's Day. And every year, the UNO comes out with a theme for the celebration, which then goes on throughout the year. And this year's theme, as far as the UNO is concerned, the United Nations organization is concerned, is women in leadership. And they call it achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. So there is a combination here of, I, I brought up the flu, the COVID, the 1911, the 1917, 18, 19, which, uh, not the 17, it started a little later, which happened a century ago as well. So 
Uh, and if you look at this uh, particular, this is on the UNOS website. And if you look at this particular uh, uh, poster, which has been uh, put up on the website, you have women of different colors. You also have women in different professions. You have a woman sports person, a white woman, you have a black woman, you have a woman astronaut, you have a woman in a hijab, you have a, another black woman, uh, this time holding, I don't know, a, a petroleum uh, pipe and putting her foot on the uh, hydrant, a water hydrant. So it is women in different professions, which this particular poster celebrates. And it talks about women in leadership. Now, if you're talking about the COVID crisis and uh, leadership of women, women are standing today right at the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. We are all there as healthcare workers, as caregivers, as innovators. We are the community organizers and as some of the most exemplary and effective national leaders who are combating the pandemic. In India, when it first struck in Kerala, the Kerala health minister, a woman, achieved a lot of success, which has unfortunately since then been wiped out. Uh, uh, well, not wiped out, but uh, decreased to a lot of extent, uh, to a great extent, was a woman. So the crisis, this uh, health crisis has highlight, highlighted both the centrality of women's contribution and the disproportionate burdens that women carry. Because these women, the health workers, caregivers, innovators, national leaders are not just doing their professional jobs, they are also homemakers, they are mothers. So they have, as usual, a double burden to carry, which is what we call a disproportionate burden that women uh, leaders carry, that women carry, especially during the COVID crisis, when women have been quarantined, women nurses, women doctors, women transport workers have been quarantined, and they have to then manage uh, through uh, maybe social media, maybe through WhatsApp, through phone calls, their homes, as well as their professional duties. Now, women leaders during the COVID, since this year is the year of women's leadership, promoting women's leadership, and uh, uh, women's organizations, women leaders have demonstrated skills, knowledge, networks to effectively lead the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. And majority of the countries that have been more successful in stemming the tide of the COVID-19 pandemic and responding to the health and the broader socioeconomic impacts are uh, headed by women. For instance, heads of governments in Denmark, Ethiopia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, New Zealand, and Slovakia, all women leaders, heads of state, have been widely recognized for the rapidity, the decisiveness, and the effectiveness of their national response to COVID-19, as well as the compassionate communication of fact-based public health information. You don't stop being compassionate just because you are a national leader. Women, these women leaders have shown both compassion as well as leadership. Now, this particular year, as far as the UNO is concerned, also brings up two major initiatives uh, that have been taken by the United Nations organizations and their various bodies. And one they call the Generation uh, Equality, which is women of different generations of uh, race, religion, country, they, uh, they will be working towards a gender equal world, which we all deserve, and a gender inclusive language. Language is very, very important because it's the key, the key factor in shaping our cultural and social attitudes. So using 
gender inclusive language is a powerful way, a very powerful way to promote gender equality and eradicate gender bias. Now, I have been telling my students for the last three decades, maybe now four decades, ever since I started teaching as a very young lecturer, that he does not include she. So you will not say he when you oh, please mute yourself. Please. Yeah, thank you. So he does not include she. So use gender inclusive language. Say he or she or else use they. I say that to my research students and they write never, never, never to put he, the masculine pronoun he, in their uh, projects, unless they are actually talking about a man and not talking about men and women, or heaven forbid, only women. They do, they do hear very strongly from me on this issue. So gender inclusive language. Now this is very, very important. It gives the right messages to young women, especially to young girls, that they have an identity which is independent of that of men. They are not included in the male identity. And the UNO has started these initiatives of equality and gender inclusive language. Now, this is where the importance of women's writing comes in. Because women's writing makes a very, very important contribution to gender equality and to gender inclusive language. Now, women, we women, I'm not just talking about the women on the platform because I'm sure there are some men as well. So women need to write themselves into existence. Men also need to write themselves into existence. You have to say, I exist. And how do you exist? You write yourself into existence. Whether you're writing a letter, you're writing a diary, you're writing a journal, you're writing a blog, you're writing a novel, you're writing a poem, you write yourself into existence. Because writing makes you visible. Not just women writing. You're talking about anyone who's on the margins, whether it's a Dalit person, whether it's somebody else, whether it's a woman, it's a third world woman, you, you are on the margins. And if you're on the margins, you have to make yourself visible. The world is not a very sympathetic place to people who live on the margins, people who are the subalterns of society. They have to assert themselves. And one way of asserting yourself is to make yourself visible and put forth your view into the world. Now, women's writing is not something new. Women haven't just got up in the 20th century, the dawn of the 20th century, and said with Virginia Woolf, I want a room of my own, I want to write. It's, it's not happened like that. Women have been writing for a millennia, for thousands of years, around the world, around the world, in different languages. They have been doing it orally, and then their writings have been put, and then their thoughts have been put, actually turned into the written word. But there's not been much visibility. So this visibility has been coming more recently. Now, women writers have in the past, and even today, I think, have all been considered inferior to men writers and publishers until the very end of the 19th century were not really ready to publish them. Not and even up to the in the 20th century itself, women write, uh, writers haven't found it easy to get publishers. And if you are an Indian woman, or if you are a woman belonging to the Dalit community, then again you will not find it at all easy to get a publisher. And many women have thus been self-publishing. A lot of women have been self-publishing starting their own publication companies because they haven't had the kind of response that they wanted from the male publishing world. The publishing world is still very, very male dominated. Now going back a little and into uh, British women's writing, many British women, many women in the Western world had to write whether they were English or French, they had to write under male pseudonyms. 
Now we know that Jane Austen's uh, books were published without her name, only her very last book in 1815 came out with, under her own name. The Bronte sisters wrote under male pseudonyms. George Eliot, of course, Mary Ann Evans never used her own female name. It was a male pseudonym, although everyone knew that this, these were women. Slowly, they came to know that they were women, but they still continued to use their male pseudonyms. Now, this is what, this is where I think that we could look at what Simone de Beauvoir, uh, the right, uh, author of The Second Sex, uh, one of the very early feminists, French feminists, said that representation of the world like the world itself is the work of men. They describe it from their own point of view, which they confuse with absolute truth. So this is why women need to write. They need to write themselves into existence. Otherwise, men will write for women. And as uh, uh, Buar has said, they write from their own point of view, they present their worldview, and then they confuse it with the absolute truth. And uh, Jane Austen has said in Persuasion that I will not let a book prove anything. They're all written by men. So there we are, the women. The women knew what was happening. The women knew the importance of writing. And they wrote, even if like Austen, they had to publish anonymously or like the Bronte sisters, they had to publish under a male pseudo. Now the subaltern position, even after women started publishing, and they were able to publish under their own names, like the early 20th century women. Now, okay, it, it reminds me about Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, which is one of the greatest Gothic novels, one of the greatest philosophical novels that has been written in the English language. This woman, very, very young girl, uh, wrote in the company of very, very dominating and assertive men like her husband Shelley and his great friend Byron. And she wrote this on the shores of an Italian lake. And uh, for a very, very long time, it was believed in the literary world that this was not really Mary Shelley writing. The story, the story was narrated by Byron and Shelley and a group of men. And she just happened to be the scribe. She just happened to be for somebody like writing down the Mahabharata, the scribe, she was just the scribe. In her edition, uh, which was much after the death of her husband, Shelley, I think it was 1832, if I'm not mistaken. In the foreword to that edition, she asserts herself and she says, this is my work. I wrote it. Nobody else wrote Frankenstein. I wrote it. All right. So they were, even when they were able to publish under their own names, and began to be studied in the academic world, they were still kept in a subaltern position by publishers, booksellers, and of course, academicians. And this was done by marking, by marking their works as women's writing. It was marked discourse. This marked discourse even today is sold in bookshops and sections labeled women's writing. Here in Germany, it says, so if you were looking for a woman's work, writers, a novel, or a, a collection of poems, it's not in the general shelves, it's in the province shelves, the women's shelves. In the academic world, women's writing is studied in distinct courses uh, that are offered, for instance, as Indian women's writing or writing by women in the 19th century, Britain. Now, this sends a very clear message that writing by men is writing. It is unmarked discourse. It's the norm. That by women is not writing. It's women's writing. And when we, uh, young academics uh, in the English uh, world, we started insisting that, I mean, when you're talking about the British novel, there, there may be one honorary man like uh, George Eliot there, or one honorary man like uh, Jane Austen, whom you just cannot leave out of the syllabus. Where are the other women? Where have they gone? We fought and we fought and then we finally got our gender course. We got our women's writing and we were so thrilled. But this actually meant that we were kept 
out of the English novel. We were kept out of the uh, Renaissance writing. We were being kept out of everything, which again became more and more, because you have your paper. You, you, you study those women over there. Why, why do you want to study them here? Indian women's writing, then why do you want to study Indian women in the general Indian writing paper? It was, it was a real catch-22 situation. So this is again something which is a second generation fight which needs to be fought that this is still marked discourse. This is still in inequality. You're calling something the novel and then you're calling something the women's writing, the women's novel. The need to celebrate women's writing. This is the reason why we need to celebrate women's writing. We have to fight for it. We have to celebrate it and bring it out of these female enclosures that men have relegated it to. Now, today you might say, then why are you talking about women's writing? Talking about women's writing because attention needs to be drawn to this category. That's why we are still talking about it. It's like it is not post-feminism. You still need feminism. So we still need this category. It is an unequal category. It is a category which is in many ways condescending, but it is still a category. And it's very interesting that when you say women's writing, it will be mainly women who will come for those courses. It will be women who will opt to do those optional papers. Like maybe this course as well. I don't know how many men we have got on board today. So it, it becomes a condescending category. So this is why we need to draw attention to it for ourselves, not just for the rest of humanity the male part of humanity, but also for ourselves that we have written like this. Our gender has come up with these classics and we've been doing it for millennia. We also need to excavate the forgotten and alighted women from the past, from the past, it's not just the present women, and reinstate them in the canons of literature in different languages around the world. And that is being done. It's being done by white women in the West, the first and second wave of feminism, the first and second generation feminists in Britain, in the USA. They have been excavating and reinstating women writers, women philosophers, uh, women scientists, and a lot of work is being done in those areas now. Today, it has also been taken up by what is what we call intersectional feminists. And it's been linked, intersectional feminists, we'll talk a little about that. And it's been linked to the voices of those experiencing overlapping and concurrent forms of oppression. You are a woman, you also are Black. You are a woman, you are also a Dalit. So there's an overlapping, concurrent form of oppression. Uh, you are a woman, you are Black, and you live in the third world the third layer of concurrent oppression. So to understand the depths of the inequalities and the relationships among uh, women in different contexts is what intersectional feminism does. Whether it's black women or third world women or women belonging to lower castes in India, belonging to lower socioeconomic strata, belonging to the third world, because you may be a woman of color, you may be Dalit, but you are writing from the United States. So you are different from this woman who is writing from uh, India, all right, a village in India. So there are more layers of oppression from that, for that woman, the Dalit woman writing in Marathi, in Gujarati, in Tamil, from India. Language is also something which gives you visibility or which denies you visibility. So this woman writer, color, Dalit, writing English, writing from the United States. There are such women writers that we have today. And the woman who's writing from India, Dalit woman from India, uh, writing in an Indian language, writing in a Dalit dialect, not just uh, an Indian language, but in a Dalit dialect. So that, that, that makes these layers upon layers of intersecting oppression so much heavier to bear. And the third world feminists, and there's a lot of work being done with third world feminism today, but again, third world feminism is again uh, fairly urban, 
uh, it is again fairly middle class, even though you say that we are women of color, we are the third world feminists. So there, there is a lot that still remains to be done to make voices of different kinds of women available, visible, heard around the world. And I have this little chart, it's, it's a little blurred, but I think it's still visible about the different kinds of feminism. Feminism is not a monolithic uh, category. Third world, postmodernist, liberal, multiracial, the Chico feminism, the Chico women, the Chico movement women were very early uh, eco feminists who didn't even know that they were eco feminists. That was a label given much later to them. Radical and womanist, libertarian, post colonial, separatist, post, of course, Marxist. Marxist feminism has got a great number of very, very strong voices, such as those of uh, Gayatri Spivak and uh, uh, the woman who she translated so splendidly, Mashweta. Devi, of course, Mashita Devi did not call herself a Marxist feminist, only a Marxist. We'll talk about that later. The history of women's writing in India. Now, Indian women, to focus only on Indian women. So, women, Indian women have been writing for a millennia. It's not just Western women who have been writing. But their voices, like those of the Western women, have been lost in a male-dominated, conservative world. The Western world was also very conservative right up to the beginning of the 20th century. And even today, in many ways, it's still a male dominated world. This is being sought to be remedied by women academics who wish to provide readers and students of literature with a balanced view of literature as an activity undertaken both by men and women. It's not just men who are the writers and women who are the women writers. This also provides women readers, students, and academics with self-esteem when they realize that women have been writing for ages and should be moved to the center of the literary discourse from the margins where they have stagnated for centuries. This is why we have to look at the history of women's writing. This is an excellent book. If you want to look at one book, if you want to possess well, actually, two books. They are in two volumes. If you want to possess two volumes of this wonderful book, which has been around for decades now, I think uh, it's almost, uh, I think, almost 30, 40, 50 years. I forget the date when it was uh, published. You can see that uh, there are the two uh, editors, Suzy Tharu, who used to teach at the uh, what was called the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, Hyderabad. Today it's ECLU, something like the PU, uh, the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. And this is A. Lalita. Now you can see this is a, a recent a picture of Suzy Karu. This is an old picture of Lalita. They were both probably the same age or Lalita a little younger than Karu. So you can imagine how long this book has been around. This is not the cover of the book uh, that I possess. The two volumes that I possess do not have this cover. They have been in print again and again. These are also available on Amazon today. So women writing in India, 600 BC to the present. A lot of research has been done. A lot of excavation of women's voices from the millennia past, going back to 600. DC. They have done excellent work, excellent digging into the past of women's writing. If there's one set of books you want to possess on this, this is what you should go for. Suzy Taru and K. Lalita not really been replaced uh, the value of these books over these decades. And there's a more recent one which belongs to the area of the graphic novel, the graphic uh, text, which is very, very current now. And this is by Samita Arini. And the uh, illustrations are by Krutika Susarala. And you can see the kind of eye-catching uh, illustrations and, and, and also the way the woman is looking at you. And a lot of those pictures that Susarala has drawn are the eyes are very, very prominent. And I'm just giving you the example of two women that have been dealt with in uh, these uh, in this particular text. 
there is Akpuri Mulla, 14th century Telugu poet, and there is Kannagi. Kannagi uh, is the central character of the Tamil, uh, Tamil epic, Silapatikaram. And uh, one is a fictional character, one is a real writer. So uh, like that, the book is full of these examples of uh, ancient uh, uh, women writers, ancient Indian women writers and fictional characters of strength and stature and weight. Uh, what has also been done in recent years is that Indian women have been rewriting the stories of uh, women from the Indian epics, especially the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which have traditionally been male dominated and written from a male point of view. There is Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni, the novelist, uh, very, very interesting novel, The Palace of Illusions. And uh, in this, Divakaruni tells us, retells, these are all retellings, retells us about the sharp, witty, brave woman with a dark complexion, and who is that uh, 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 smart, dark complexion woman? She's Panchali, she's Draupadi, all right? It retells the story from Draupadi's point of view. You had the much older woman writer, Iravati Karves, Dukhanta, the end of an epoch. It creates human persona, uh, whether it is uh, Draupadi or whether it's the Pandavas, or all the characters of the Mahabharata. There is Sita's Ramayana, also another book by that graphic writer that I was talking to you about, Samita Arini, and it's a graphic novel. It tells you the story of the Ramayana from Sita's point of view, Sita's Ramayana. There is The Missing, the Missing Queen is another novel, again by Arini, which tells you about uh, how Sita was banished from the court, uh, which is something which the Ramayana downplays. And it is a story of Sita, the banishment of Sita, which is retold by a uh, modern day journalist, funky woman journalist, you know, investigative journalism, the missing queen, where did she go? Where is she today? Now, another uh, writer who has taken on the male dominated Indian epics is of course, Mashweta Devi. And after Kurukshetra is a set of plays that raises very important questions. After the war of Kurukshetra, what happened after the war of Kurukshetra? And it philosophizes on the egotistic nature of the war, the ego of the male, the male egotistic nature of the war, and about the status of women at that time. So there are many, many retellings of uh, women's stories from the Indian epics by contemporary women writers. Now going back to the women writers in ancient India, Tharu and Lalita, the book that I referred to, in their introduction, they, uh, they take you back <clears throat> to the Vedic times and say that why are there not more women writers in the Vedic times? And, and they say that that is because of the male domination during that time. There were women scholars, there were women philosophers in their age. Why do we not have more records of their writing? It's a very interesting uh, paper by this scholar, uh, Michael Witzelin. And uh, the paper is called Female Issues and Philosophers in the Vedas. And he says that there were women authors in the Rig Vedic period, and he gives you a list of their names. But he says that very often, uh, these were not really the actual authors, they were the interlocutors, and that is why they are not mentioned as authors. Now, why were they interlocutors? Who said they were interlocutors? Maybe they were really the authors, we don't know. There are other scholars, uh, including Vidzilin, who say that Sanskrit was the language of religion and culture of the court of those times, and few women would have had access to it. They would have had prakrit, even if they could read and write, if they were literate, they would have prakrit and not Sanskrit. But then uh, Tharu and uh, Lalita tell us that yes, there is, there is writing by women in prakrit. So that is something, but, but that writing again 
is coming to you mediated through the male voice. So it's very difficult to actually get hold of these female voices from the past, but they have managed to get some. What they have actually got more than the Sanskrit, uh, uh, the voices in Sanskrit of women, they have got voices of the Buddhist nuns, the writings of the Buddhist nuns. And going back to the sixth century before Christ, they have got it from the Perigatha, that is the writings of the wise old women. And these are the Buddhist nuns, and they wrote poems, they wrote tracts, and they were they were preserved. So, but not in Sanskrit, they were in Pali, that was the language of the times. And they have also got writings from Tamil, from the Sangam period. And those have been preserved, women's writing. And from the Tamil period, the Sangam period, they have got uh, several writers they have got, but what caught my eye was uh, this writer, Avaya. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrongly, but Avaya. And uh, we are told that there were several Avayas because Avaya actually means a respectable woman. There's even a Tamil film I got to know, which is called Avaya by, by uh, Vasan, Vasan film. Now, the first Avaya, the earliest Avaya, her writing, third century before Christ, she has written up to 59 poems which have been preserved and they are available in Tamil, all right? Now from the Perigatha, I just thought we could look at a couple of these poems. There is a poem, there is a poem by this Buddhist nun called Mutta and this is all collected in, in the Pali language in the Perigatha. So free, thoroughly free am I from three crooked things set free, from mortar, pestle, and a crooked old husband. Having uprooted the craving that leads to becoming, I am set free from aging and death. Now, this is a common theme which runs through the writing of a lot of women, even the bhakti, uh, the uh, sant poets, the women poets from the bhakti period, they write about their domestic lives, the chores, the domestic chores, the sheer fatigue, the mothers-in-law, the sisters-in-law, the husbands who beat them. They write about all this. And this, this nun is obviously somebody who was a householder who then became a nun. And then there is Dhamma, that is uh, uh, Dharma in a way. Wandering, another nun writing, wandering for arms, weak, leaning on a staff with trembling limbs, I fell down right there on the ground. Seeing the drawbacks of the body, my mind was then set free. The whole idea of moksha, all right? So these are, I mean, there are many, many more hymns that you have in, uh, and you can find it online. You can find it in Lalita and uh, uh, Tharu's uh, collection as well. Now, by one of the Avayas, the first Avaya, Real learning, real vision. I've got two poems. There are many, many more that you have. Real learning is that which places you in the state of deathless. And real food is what you consume when you are totally liberated and when you are not under any command. When, and where you are neither slave nor serve. Very much a woman's voice. The food, the food metaphor is there. What sets you free? learning sets you free and food which you do not eat as a slave a woman woman ate food generally as a slave i mean she cooked for everyone but she ate last real vision real vision is that that sees the one only beyond the many one the divine real valor is that of the person who has conquered for good the senses by the poem goes on so it's, uh, there's a lot of philosophizing. It's not always about the mortar and the pestle and the crooked husband. There's also a lot of philosophizing as to what is real vision. The bhakti moment. I'm going to take a big jump. The bhakti moment. Now, the bhakti moment, moment is generally considered to have arisen in the 7th century AD. It really peaked in the 12th century and continued till the 17th century. So there are many centuries covered by the Bhakti movement. Many women poets from the Bhakti movement, a very important uh, moment in time when Indian women 
wrote and their poetry was recorded is still available in oral literature, available in written literature, which makes this a very, very important area. First arose in the South and then moved northwards. Now, what is unique about this movement is that it encompassed lower caste men and women, women belonging to all castes, belonging to all strata of society. So this was a quest for direct communication with the divine, direct union with the divine, without the mediation of the Brahmin, without the mediation of the priestly class men. This was bhakti, this was devotion in the language of the people and not Sanskrit. So the saint poets of this movement wrote in the local languages, but it was also a mo movement that focused on oral transmission of poetry by the sun poets. They wrote, but there was also oral transmission. And these men and women, the sons, both the male sons as well as the female sons, were often shunned by the upper caste male dominated society because they had dared to transgress into the Brahminical strongholds, the male stronghold, male Brahminical strongholds, uh, a common category of religion and worship. The Bhakti women poets, now many of the Bhakti women poets were householders. And like those uh, early Sangam and uh, uh, Buddhist nun poets wrote of their domestic lives, wrote about their uh, being householders. Now, there is a very, very important poet from, there are several very important poets from Maharashtra and Karnataka. Uh, so, Akamma Devi from Karnataka, known as Akka or Mahadevi, she was a worshipper of Shiva. They were both Shaivite as well as Vaishnavite traditions in the Bhakti movement. So, she was a worshipper of uh, uh, Shiva. There was Janabai, very well known in Maharashtra. Her abhams are still sung born in a low caste, she was a maid who worked in the house of another bhakti poet, a bhakti son, Namdev, and she wrote over 300 poems. And a lot of her poems were focused on domestic chores and her life as a low caste woman. So it's a good documentation of the lives of these low caste women. And there was also Mirabai going further northwest, Mirabai. Mirabai, from a very, I mean, Mirabai is of course, like Janabai and Kamma Devi, one of the more visible bhakti uh, poets whose songs are still sung, whose bhajans are still sung today. So his Rajput princess, as we know, left her husband, the Rana, and led a wanderer's existence, singing of the love of the beloved Lord Krishna. And of course, with Janabai, it was Vikroba, Pandara, Pandara. And uh, Bahinabai, again from Maharashtra, again of Vikoba, Vikoba being a manifestation of Krishna. And, and a lot of these poems were focused also on sexuality. They wrote very openly about sexuality. So childhood, puberty, and married life, which of course was very shocking to the uh, Brahminical male-dominated society. Uh, Janabai, one of her very, very famous uh, poems, Cast Off All Shame and Sell Yourself in the Marketplace. Then alone can you hope to reach the Lord. Symbols and hands, a veena upon my shoulder, go about. Who dares to stop me? The pallor of my sari falls away, a scandal. Yet will I enter the crowded marketplace without a thought. Jani, Janabai says, my Lord, I have become a slut to reach your home, cast of all shame. You can go on and on trying to analyze a poem like that. What does it mean? The whole idea of shame, lajja, the whole idea of cover your breasts and pull down your skirts and don't keep your legs wide open. The whole idea of male domination and the male construct of female shame. Now, she, she's com completely transgressive. This is a very, very transgressive poem. Mirabai, life without hurry is no life, my friend. Life without hurry is no life, friend. And though my mother-in-law fights and my sister-in-law teases and the Rana, the husband is angered, a guard stationed on a stool outside and a lock is mounted on the door. 
how can I abandon the love I have loved in life after life? Mira's Lord is the mountain lifter, Giridari. Why should I want any man? That's again, a complete rejection of uh, the male society, the whole idea of marriage and a woman's uh, position in her married home. Women writers in the Mughal period. Now, this, this, this was, as I said, right from the 12th century to the 17th century. And at the same time, you also have the Mughal period happening. The women writers of the Mughal period, whose writings are still available to us today, were mainly from the zanana of the Mughal emperors. They were sisters, daughters, mothers, wives. The earliest example we have is of Gulbadan Begum. She was the sister of Humayun and the daughter of Emperor Babur. She chronicled the history of her brother's court in her book, Evale Humayun Baksha, one of the earliest Mughal histories available, written by a woman in the 16th century, uh, common era. Uh, and she also wrote about her life in the Zanana. So it's a good social document, a historical document, a social document. And she writes about a women's only uh, pilgrimage on which she had gone uh, to Mecca, a Hajj. So this, this becomes a very, very important documentary writing. Then there is, of course, Emperor Jahangir's 20th and last wife, Empress Nur Jahan, who rapidly became the de facto ruler of the Mughal Empire. And she issued permands. That is her writing. She issued permands, orders, and minted coins, the inscriptions on the coins in her own name. Uh, Jahanara. Emperor Shah Jahan's daughter was a Sufi poet in her own right. She commissioned poetry, she commissioned translation, she wrote Risalai, Sahib Yavas, a biography of her spiritual master, Mullah Shah, and she also wrote a biography of the same Moin Dil Chisti. Her niece, Emperor Aurangzeb's daughter, Zebunisa, was an accomplished scholar, a patron of arts, a poet. And she was her father's favorite, but later fell out of prison, uh, favor over. There, there are very many versions of what happened between Aurangzeb and his favorite daughter, and was in prison for 20 long years by her father. Now, of course, in popular culture as well, we have the stories of these women, whether it's in Hindi cinema or in uh, Urdu shairi and Persian. Uh, uh, Puzzles, et cetera, we have the stories of these women. Now, women writers, again, another leap, women writers of the reform period. Now, when we say the reform, we're talking about the 19th century, we are talking about the second half of the 19th century, we are talking about also the Bengal Renaissance, all right? Uh, now, Savitra Bai, which, which was not just in Bengal, in Maharashtra as well, so the Bengal Renaissance as well as the reform movements in Maharashtra. So Savitri Bai Phule in 19th century, is one of the pioneers of women's education in India, along with her husband, Jyoti Rao Phule. And she has written poetry which reflects upon the struggles and ideals of both the husband and wife, which were published in uh, compilations called Kavya Phule and Bhavan Kashi Subodh Ratnagar. So, she has written a lot, and, and what Lalita and Haru have given us are some of her letters, which are very interesting letters of Savitri Bai to her husband Jyotika. And they're very nice uh, love letters in a way, but they also are very serious letters which talk about their life, life work. Then there was Pandita Rama Bai, another very big visible reformist woman from Maharashtra, married outside her community and caste travel within and outside her country, establish educational uh, uh, organization. She studied medicine and horror of horrors, she converted to Christianity. She set many precedents for successive feminists, for feminists to come. These women didn't call themselves feminists. There was no feminism as such, ideological feminism. Her most important publication, Ramabai's, is and again, these are the women who are being studied today. I almost had a PhD student, one who was going to uh, who knew Marathi, uh, native speaker of Marathi as well as English. 
who chickened out at the last moment from doing a PhD on, on these women writers. Uh, I mean, these uh, reformist women of Maharashtra. Pandita Ramabai, a uh, high caste uh, Hindu women, woman, expose all manners of gender oppression, disguised as tradition and custom. They were Bengali women, but also contributors to the literature of the Renaissance. This, this was a Bengal Renaissance as well. And I'm just focusing upon one Bengali woman writer, a Muslim Bengali woman writer, Rukhaya Shekhavat Hussain and Sultana's Dream. Now, Sultana's Dream is a book which has been much studied by feminists, much studied by post-colonial theorists all around the world. And it is seen as early utopian feminist writing. Now, this, this writing of Savitri Bai, Rama Bai, and the Bengal Renaissance, and many other Bengal, uh, Bengali women writers, could be also seen as the first wave of Indian feminism, what we may consider the first proto, proto feminist wave, Indian feminism, and not under the influence of the West. This was not an influence of any Western feminism. This was not part of the suffragist movement, which was also raging around that time or a little later, continued till the first quarter of the 20th century when women were given the vote in uh, the Western world, parts of the Western world. Nationalist period. Let's, let's move to the nationalist period. And Tharu and Lalita, uh, their introductions are also very interesting if you want to read them. Very theoretical, but uh, interesting if you want to pick out things. Uh, that women were at this, the women of the nationalist period, they write, were empowered by the task of freeing the nation from foreign rule and their own significant position in the center. But it came out of the homes, it came out of the enclosures, the domestic enclosures, into the political space, into the national space. And they, they were writers, women, novelists, they were activists, they wrote diaries, they wrote uh, tracts. And if you're talking about literature, Nirupama Devi at that time was writing very popular uh, novels, which were very traditional, but the women had strength and influence. Writing of Ma Devi Varma, Subhadra Kumari Chauhan, Guru Ben Patel, Bal Balamani Amma, talking about writings in different languages. Women joined the national movement, as I said, in huge numbers and were at the forefront of the Salt Satyagra and the Quit India movement. So that the female body, the female body was part of the national space. The female body also took the blows of the lathis of the colonial, British colonial police. Now, as far as women, highly visible women writers in the Political movement were concerned, of course, Sarojini Naidu is a big name, an acknowledged poet who Gandhiji called the Nightingale of India. She was also a court jester. And she alone had the temerity, the courage to question the old man and at times spoke fun at him. So there was Sarojini Naidu. Of course, her writing underwent a great deal of uh, eclipse during the 1950s and 60s in post colonial India then uh, canon uh, makers of that period, Indian literature canon makers of that period, uh, shot down her poetry and called it uh, old fashioned and called it uh, a rhyming, a rhymester instead of a poet. But, but she has been reinstated. She has been revived today. And a lot of very serious work is being done on Sarojini Naidu's poetry. The second wave of feminist writers in the 20th century. Now, the second wave of Indian feminism, uh, we're talking about that proto-feminism and the early feminism, and now we are into the second wave of feminism, spearheaded by writers like Isma Chuktai, Amrita Pritam, our Mashweta Devi, Krishna Sokti, Kamla Das, Kamla Markandeya. Now, their works explored boundaries, bodies, female sexualities, alternative sexuality, the whole idea of the body. Kamda Das has written so many poems on the body. Uh, Mashita Devi, of course, looks at the female body very differently from Kamla Das, but she does look with a very, very uh, clear eye on the female body. Uh, the breast givers is her collection of stories. And the way a man looks at a woman's body, especially the breast, and the way 
Mashita Devi has looked at dress as an ideological construct, not as an erotic construct. Now, these women were negotiating their place in a new nation, still smarting from the wounds of partition. When, when the partition was written across the bodies of women, you're talking about breasts, when breasts were cut off, put into uh, gunny bags and sent across the borders and trains. Okay, so uh, the partition, the new nations, the history of these two new nations, Pakistan and India, were written across the bodies of Indian women and what became Pakistani women. Now, Chuktai, Isma Chuktai, of course, was especially known for her radical feminist views. She was, in fact, hauled up before the law courts on obscenity charges for her story in Bihar. That all happened in uh, British India, of course, but it wouldn't have been different if India had been an uh, independent country either. Now, these women, this new breed of women, unlike the proto-women and the first wave of Indian feminists were not totally innocent of uh, feminist uh, writings, feminist theorizing from the West. But they had their own ideologies. They had their own worldviews. They, they were not completely influenced by the Western uh, feminist uh, ideologies. And the early post-colonial Indian feminist writers, specifically feminists, I'm bringing back Mashita Devi, you have Krishna Sopti, Mitro Marjani, you have uh, Pritam, Namrita Pritam, Spinger, you have Das's autobi autobiography, My Life, your Mashita Devi's uh, breast stories that I have spoken about, translated by Gayatri Spivak, the self-defined Marxist feminist. Now, these women were more ideologically engaged. And, and as I've said, Mashita Devi did not describe herself as a feminist. But her translator, Gayatri Spivak, describes herself, i.e. Spivak, as a Marxist feminist and even directly imputes a similar ideology to the author, to her beloved author, Mashita Devi, as well. Maybe I mistake that, I don't know. The new generation of Indian women writers and feminists. Anita Desai, Shashi Deshpande, Bharti Mukherjee, and some others have also, like these earlier uh, writers, denied any sort of feminist bias in their writing. But if you do an in-depth analysis, it proves that they, they have very strong feminist intent. There are women's issues are the chief characteristics of their plot. But more recent writers, women writers, such as Arundhati Roy, Gita Hariharan, Namita Gokhale, Anita Nair, Manju Kapoor, I'm taking names because naming is very, a very, very important feminist issue. We excavate, rehabilitate, name. Naming makes people visible. Naming makes women visible. These are, I mean, there's so many women. Name them. Don't say, where are the women like this? Name them. Uh, more upfront about their feminist parents. In other languages, too, we have writers such as Alka Saraogi, who writes in Hindi uh, from both the male as the female perspective, male and female perspective about the Marwari diaspora in Calcutta. So there are many, many writers who are more upfront about their feminist intent, their feminist perspectives. Now, this brings us to uh, the course that this is the inaugural lecture of the course that I'll be doing uh, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Sridhar Ajayaswaran and Dr. Preeti Shirodkar. Uh, those of you who have done courses earlier with Mr. Sen know both these excellent teachers. So, and of course, we are very happy to have Professor Sridhar with us because feminism doesn't really consider uh, 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 concern just women, it's a human issue, all right? So when you're talking about women's writing, feminist perspectives, feminist readings of women's writing, men have to do it as well. And the male perspective is very, very, very important on as far as feminism is concerned. Otherwise it becomes a kind of an, uh, uh, a kind of a incestuous kind of activity 
done only by women, for women, of the women kind of thing. It, it is a human issue. So the uh, text that we are going to be looking at, in his writing that we are going to be looking at, uh, Mashweta Devi's Mother of uh, 1084, which has also been made into an excellent film, Hazar Chaurasya Ki Maag. The number is the number given to the Naksal prisoner or the young boy, young man, Brati, who was picked up by the state and imprisoned, taken away, and finally killed. One of those custodial death stories. And the mother, the mother figure, and who is she, what is she? And how does she, how does she conduct herself? And what is the, if, and then the, there is the girlfriend, Brati's girlfriend, who is also an activist. So there are two major, and there is a third woman who is the lower caste, lower socioeconomic strata woman, who is the mother of yet another young man who is killed in the custodial killings, which took place during the Nakshal moment in uh, Calcutta in the 1970s, I think. So it's, it's these women, all right? So mother of 1084. Uh, Shashi Deshpande's country of deceit. Now, Deshpande is uh, one of our very leading writers today. And a lot of uh, uh, the very, what would you call, conservative Western feminists would think that, or Lino critics would consider that she's not a feminist writer because she doesn't have any radical uh, women characters who, who are very transgressive, but these are women who are, or women are the women who make spaces for themselves in within the male enclosures. They are not autonomous spaces, they are spaces that will push the male dominated uh, uh, whatever constructs which are there, they push them aside and they push their noses out maybe, or their face out, whatever they can. So this is what you also call third world feminism, which is not really about complete female autonomy, but female, uh, what would you say, female visibility, uh, female uh, independence, or rather a lowering of the amount of female dependency within male dominated societies. So this is, I mean, it's much more difficult than saying, oh, I'm leaving home, I'm going away, and I don't need a man in my life. This is not what she's saying, all right? Gita Harinaran, The Thousand Faces of Night, which is again a book which we are going to do. Very much ideologically oriented. Uh, there is the uh, feminist utopias, there, are, there is the Amazonian women in it, there are feminist fantasies. But then ultimately the women come down to earth. And this is also a mother-daughter story. And uh, Sita is the mother and Devi is the daughter. I mean, you get the uh, epic references, Sita and Devi. And, um, and it's a very, very uh, uh, fraught relationship between the mother and daughter, which is again part of the feminist ideology. The mother-daughter tension, the mother-daughter relationship in feminist writing, in Western feminist writing, in Western feminist uh, critical writing, theoretical writing. And then there's, of course, having the big voice, the God of Small Things. The God of Small Things is her first novel, which for a very long time remained her only novel. Of course, she has written uh, another novel since then. But uh, I really think that this is the novel we need to look at because that new novel, what is it, something Ministry of Happiness, I forget the exact title, although I have it right here behind me. Uh, it's actually, I feel, that's a novel which was so long in writing, she could have written three novels out, one on transgender, one on Kashmir, one, one on something else, but she put it all into one novel. Maybe her publisher got tired of waiting for one novel, let alone three novels to come this way or her this way probably. So uh, it's it's this this is a much better book and it deals with uh, it deals I mean politics. It's very much politics. I'm going to stop now so that uh, we have time for questions. But um, there is politics. There is 
uh, female sexuality and uh, there are there are all kinds of taboo transgressive issues in the novel and uh, such as uh, a dalit lover the mother ammu and her dalit lover so there is untouchability so that is a boundary a border which is crossed by the woman and then there's the also the border crossed by the twins the woman's children the boy and the girl who who have a sexual relationship or one sexual encounter and that's yet another transgressive border which is crossed and the title itself is so very evocative it's not your it's the god with a capital g but uh, the god of small things all right and the small and there's also incest i mean there's incest there is taboo sex sex uh, taboo according to caste there is incest and there is also sexual molestations and uh, uh, pedophilia the way children are sexually molested so and then there is of course uh, religion religion and the way it treats women so uh, the religion here being uh, syrian christianity so it it's it's a very uh, it's a very layered book and i think we are going to have a lot of interesting discussions on it so we are going to be doing these four books and we are going to be looking sorry for the blur we're going to be looking at uh, these books uh, from a post colonial and third world feminism point of view okay so uh, we are not going to be looking at it from the western uh, feminist point of view but third world uh, post colonial point of view where there is a colonial experience oppression is there there is a post colonial feminism is there and there is the object the portrayal of women of non western societies as passive voiceless these are not passive voiceless women sita is not a passive voiceless woman in thousand faces of night although her daughter who has studied abroad and had a black boyfriend a black lover might appear to be more feminist sita turns out to be the mother turns out to be the greater feminist in gita hari haran's book and western women are not necessarily modern and educated and empowered as compared to indian women so it's not um, it's uh, the woman the mother in 1084 is as empowered in her own way the slum dwelling woman in mother of 1084 is as empowered and modern in her own way as are the uh, western women in writings by Uh, western women writers who write from a feminist perspective so that is what we are going to be looking at and i will end with say a feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and full humanity of women and men okay thank you very much i'll stop sharing Okay, so the session that was wonderful. Who is that, Mukda? Yes. <laughs> you are still there. Okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So I hope we have some questions. One temptation overcome, and then. <laughs> okay. We have about ten fifteen minutes, Mukda, for questions. Yeah, yeah, we have. Um. there are some things in the uh uh chat box uh we have uh, we have uh, nagma saying uh, sonika saying she read uh the two the lalita thing from uh, Uh, then there is rama bishnoi talking about avaiya okay yeah there are many many andal is there there are many poets saints women saints from tamil nadu i have just taken the example of one name which was probably a, a pseudonym because there were so many avaiyas and avaiyas is a term of respect the respected woman okay sonika is saying thank you then 
thank you, Sonika, for being there. I appreciate all the repeat students that we have. It's uh, wonderful to have you coming course after course. It, it creates a kind of a family, a kind of a literary, literary family that we have now. Anyone, you can unmute yourselves and talk if you want. I don't know. As far as uh, we Indian, yeah, sorry, somebody is speaking. Yes, carry on. No? Okay, so what I was saying was that uh, in a sense, I mean, I'm much older than Dr. Mukta, but uh, we are in that sense, the almost like a one and a half uh, generation of feminists. And uh, you younger women are the second and even the third generation of feminists, uh, uh, women in India who may or may not be feminists. And uh, I, I just feel that the, the the movement needs to go forward because the fight has not been won as yet. I mean, some of us fortunate women like myself or Dr. Mukta may be in a very different position, but not all my students, uh, not those who have done so well, who are married off just before their final MA exams and they are gold medalists and then they and they go through this very uh, oppressive, uh, uh, not oppressive maybe, very nice dominating fathers-in-law and brothers-in-law, not just uh, dominating husbands, but the joint family. And one feels, my God, what happened to this girl? She was, she was so good. She could have, she could have gone anywhere at all in life. And she's. Uh, and then maybe when they start teaching, when they uh, finally do their uh, beards or uh, their net exams or whatever, then you see, even at this age, if they are they are doing it after ten years. It's not ten years too late. It is. It's 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 correct for them. It is fine. Let them do it. Let them do it. Uh, hey hey hey. Uh, this is somebody asking, will it be? <laughs> uh, uh, San, okay, before that, uh, uh, there is Sanya Narulkar. Uh, yes, eternal vigilance is the is the price of liberty, the cost of liberty. Yes, and uh, will it be required to read all the books? <laughs> try to read them. Try to read about them at least, and I during these courses. And they can, you can read it even after the course. After the course, we have found that. That is feasible. <laughs> yeah, many, many of the students who did our earlier courses, they they read the books after the course and then they wrote, we keep our WhatsApp page, group page going and uh, we find them writing about it and we have a discussion going at time because not all the time, but at least in the beginning when they say, oh, I've read it. And then they discuss um, among themselves, which is peer learning, which is very, very important. Yes, Rama, thank you. Uh, this eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. It uh, was a very favorite quotation of one of my professors at National College where I did my BA in National College, Bandra, Professor Adwani. Uh, I, I did it with English literature and political science. So he was a political scientist and he used to quote this, eternal vigilance is the price of uh, liberty, price of freedom. Some of the younger women may remember constant vigilance from Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. But uh, you have J.K. Rowling not using her full name. So it is, it's very interesting because 
then you might have uh, young yes. boy boy readers thinking male readers thinking oh this is for girls only like Enid Blyton's books etc although Enid Blyton's uh, uh, girls were great tomboys very very male oriented when is the full length course of mom see it's starting from tomorrow evening same time same place I suppose uh, uh, you will need to register. Uh, I think Mukta, they are asking for the details of the course. I'll put yeah. the registration link in the chat box, ma'am. Okay. And in the WhatsApp group also. Yes, But it's easy. Once you get the registration link, click on it, enroll yourself, pay the fees and enroll yourself. It's 800 rupees. And uh, you will get the recordings for 48 hours. So in case you miss the class or because of your uh, work from home schedules, you cannot attend it at the, the particular time, you can get it for 48 hours. But within those 48 hours, you have to listen to her once. You can, of course, listen to her twice or thrice. Not only her, but Preeti and Rida, all three of them. Without saying much, we are, you know, uh, nurturing the culture of reading. Where's that sound coming from? Somebody's mic is unmuted. Okay, I think that was yeah. good. Uh, uh, Rashida says, add me to the WhatsApp group, uh, paid the fees. Please check your spam mail. Once you have paid the fees and uh, you have uh, received uh, the receipt, um, the, the, the mail gets sent automatically to your email ID. If you have put your email ID correctly, then you will get it. Just che check your spam folders. Mo most of the times it goes there, lands there. And uh, still, if you don't receive it, let us know. We will, of course, I was getting, you. Uh, I was getting a bit confused with what was in the chat box, Nilufar's iPad. So I have a namesake. <laughs> yeah, Nilufar uh, Vadia. Yes, I will say ever... Nilufar Vadia. The one who okay. sketches, the oh. one who sketched you. Do you remember oh. Nilufar Vadia? Oh, welcome back, Nilufar. Welcome back. I was getting very, very confused. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I definitely would love to do these three, but I'm I'm not read the books except for God of Small Things. Okay, that's your choice. If you wish to do that, I would love to. Think would. About it, you can do that. Also. But the, as she, as we said, you don't really have to have read the books. You first learn about them, and then read. Then you can relate to it even uh, in a deeper sense. Maybe. Maybe, maybe yes. Uh, I, yes, but Dr. Barucha's insights, you can relate to it. There is Anvesha who is saying, uh, talk about gender and ethnicity. Yes, when we say ethnicity, you're talking about, uh, basically it is race, uh, ethnic, ethnic. Uh, so whether you are uh, a Caucasian or you are, uh, you are a Dravidian or you are a supposed Indo-Aryan, although that is a doubtful kind of uh, controversial uh, definition these days or whether you are, uh, you belong to one of the Mongol races. So that is your ethnic identity. So in a sense, it overlaps. It overlaps ethnicity. And ethnicity, ethnic is also a very marked uh, term, marked discourse, marked discourse. Yes, we'll talk about that. Yes, Nagma, thank you. So what do you say, Mukta, if there are no more Queries, questions. Yes, most of us are going to meet tomorrow. Yes, we'll meet tomorrow and hope to see most of you who have been yes. here today, tomorrow right. as well. Right. So, good evening and happy Women's Day. And Happy course, Women's Day to all of you. Have a good dinner somewhere. Yeah, good dinner. <laughs> I hope somebody has cooked your dinner for you today instead of you cooking the dinner for everyone as you do every day. Okay. All right. Okay. Good night then. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Wishing you a happy very uh, women's day. Same to you, same to all of us.